In this video, we're gonna look at building this really cool dining table from a slab of elm. I'm gonna show the entire process in detail and to be completely accurate, we need to start at the very beginning. So, back in February of 2020, I cut this log into 3 inch thick slabs using the Alaskan mill. I have made videos about this before and I try and get the point across that chainsaw milling is a great way for anybody to make some money saw milling big logs or to supply your woodworking business with materials. This type of work is incredibly messy. A typical log like this will usually yield four or five tabletop slabs and another three or so smaller slabs. And these in particular was on average three square meters per slab. Since I have a kiln, I can air dry until the wood gets below the fiber saturation point, which is around 30%. And then kiln dry the last bit, which in this case took 10 weeks. I have all the slabs from this log to a stable moisture content of about 6 to 10%. So in total, it took 20 months from the day I cut this log to the day I could build this table. This process actually takes quite a long time. And the first step, once we have the wood dry and stable, is to put this slab on the giant wood flattener. Uh, maybe that's a stupid name, but I have to call it something since it isn't quite yet a CNC router and not really a router sled either. But anyway, this slab would obviously not fit in your standard thickness planer. And even if it would, that alone wouldn't make it flat. So a great and again, very cost effective way to get a large slab very flat is to build a router sled. If you want to see a video about building this particular machine, then you can watch my previous video by clicking the link in the description. This time I did something a little different than what I have in the past. And that is I did the majority of the epoxy work before I did the flattening. It was a little bit tricky, but this ended up being really good in the end, since this allowed me to immediately install the C channels right after I got it flat. And let me just give you a few observations. Firstly, they need to be properly dried. Sure, a few percent here or there might not be the end of the world, but if it still has a bit ways to go, it will most likely cup and or twist as it continues to dry. But even if your wood is perfectly dry, I'm sure most people are familiar with cross-cutting a piece of wood with either a circular saw or a handsaw and getting about halfway or so into the wood and all of a sudden the kerf closes up and your saw gets stuck. This is because of tension in the wood and this same thing can happen when you run a piece of wood through a planer. But instead the tension can make the wood cup a little bit, almost right after you get it done planing. This doesn't happen to all pieces of wood but some do act in this way and it can be really annoying. So getting those C channels installed right away can avoid any potential problems. Oh, and uh, let me just say that I recently purchased this Festool OF2200 to make this job a little easier. And it does have a lot of power and cuts the slots for the C channel without much effort at all. For all these years, I have been using my tiny little Makita trim router to do this, but it was painfully slow. I have also altered my C-channels a little bit to make them a few millimeters shorter than before, so I can have them be completely recessed to make them sit flush with the underside of the tabletop. A minor detail perhaps, but it looks really good this way. Okay, so after having removed the cup and twist on the flattener, we do expose some cracks and defects that the initial epoxy pour didn't reach. So at this stage, we can do some small touch-ups. And if you notice, I put lacquer around the area that I'm putting the epoxy. That's because this elm was prone to staining and the lacquer worked great to prevent any epoxy spills from leaving ugly stains in the wood, which would be really difficult to remove. I used a fast setting epoxy and I let it fully cure which takes about a day 
Then I can begin my rough sanding to remove the excess epoxy and the cutter marks that are left by the flattener. These marks can be quite difficult to see, so a tip is to use a bright light and shine it at an angle. The shadows doesn't lie and you are able to see imperfections in the surface very easily. The rough sanding is done using a Festool Rotex. I then switch to my new secret weapon, uh, which isn't really a secret, but anyway. This is also fairly new and I do intend to make a review about this sander because I find it to be very good for this application. It's made by Merca and I guess it's a drywall sander, but it's a little bit more compact. It has a 225 millimeter diameter pad and it makes sanding large surfaces a breeze. It's, it's super easy. The large handle gives me access to the entire surface mostly without having to walk around to the other side. So stay tuned for that review if you want the details on this sander. And before I do my final finish sanding, we uh, need to cut some bow ties on the bandsaw. Now, I have a hard time throwing away wood. Even cutoffs or small pieces are great to keep around because you can always find some use for them eventually. I decided to use cutoffs from the actual slab to make the bow ties. This will be the best match in terms of color and grain. And I felt I wanted to make them blend in with the rest of the table. Keep in mind, grain direction is important when making bow ties. Uh, the grain needs to be running vertically or else they could split apart. Now, one little trick that I do is after I cut them on the bandsaw, I give them just a, 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 a tiny little pass with this super tiny little belt sander that I have. And I have it tuned to cut a slight angle. This makes the bow tie just a, a little bit wedge shaped, resulting in a very nice and tight fit. So what I do is I put a dab of glue to hold them in place as I trace the outline with a marking knife. Cutting out the waist can be done either by using just a drill bit or you know preferably a router but you can also just use your chisel for this making sure the bottom is cleaned out as well and then chamfer the bottom of the bow tie that just makes sure that it uh, goes in fairly straight oh and uh, make sure to number them as well so you know which of the bow ties goes where if you do make them like i do they can be slightly different from each other when you make them by hand like this this just makes it a lot easier to keep track of which of them goes where. I get a lot of elm that has died from the Dutch elm disease and when that happens the bark just it just falls off basically and this was no different as sad as that may be at least it makes finishing the live edge really easy I just give it a light sanding with some 180 grit to take off the gray color and I did go pretty easy since the shape of it was uh, very appealing it had a lot of bumps and and tiny details so then I used a nylon wheel to brush off any dirt or dust that was there. And I think it's important to spend some time making the live edge feel really smooth. When making a live edge table, one of the first things that grabs people's attention is the organic shape of the piece. And they always run their fingers along the, along the edge. So I think it deserves some extra attention. As you can see, now we are working on the top side of the tabletop. And again, I do my normal sanding routine to get rid of the cutter marks. Then I use some CA glue on any remaining small defects. And then I install the remaining bow ties. This crack is left open since it looked pretty cool and it then made sense to incorporate bow ties into the design. The Makita router has horrible dust extraction compared to the Festool. 
and I guess it can be a bit difficult to see here on video, but I am sitting in a cloud of dust. And a good way to remove the sawdust from particularly your eyes is to, you know, suck it off with a vacuum instead of rubbing it off with your hands and potentially rubbing the dust into your eyes. But don't go too close or it could uh, suck your eyelids right open and make it flutter around inside the vacuum hose. Uh, it's a little bit uncomfortable. I then cut the table to its final length and then go to make the steel legs. The legs are made from flat bar and I will put the dimensions on the screen. They are bent to shape and then welded to a mounting plate. The holes in the mounting plate are twice the size of the screws that I use. And that's just to account for the tiny bit of wood movement that could potentially happen, you know. And then I use the OF2200 again to mill out the recess to also have the mounting plate uh, of the legs sit flush with the bottom, just like the C channels. Then I make my final pass with a sander using 180 grit. I break all the edges by hand and then we are ready to apply the finish.